Good morning, good evening, um, and welcome to this uh, ORF event, uh, which is going to be discussing something of uh, relevance and importance. Uh, uh, relevant because uh, in some sense it engages with what we are experiencing as a global community today and important because how we respond to this may put together a framework and architecture for the future. Uh, so um, uh, let me welcome all the panelists, uh, Kaya Kiglik, Dhruv Pava, Helen Durham, uh, the moderator Arjun Jay Kumar, Ambassador Mandeep Gill and Dr. Gulshan Rai uh, to this uh, discussion. Uh, let me also welcome all the viewers on uh, Zoom who are joining us at this, uh, on this webinar. And also um, say hello to all the online viewers of ORF who will be watching this in our, on our uh, digital properties later in the evening. Uh, in the month of May, the ICRC made a call to governments. Uh, it implored the governments to work together to stop cyber attacks on healthcare. The driver for this call comes from international humanitarian law, in particular the Geneva Conventions, which state that all wounded sick including combatants, including combatants, are entitled to medical care in international and non-international armed conflict. Uh, Helen Durham, who's joining us uh, this afternoon, the ICRC's Director of International Law and Policy, stressed recently that basic rules of humanitarian law should also apply in cyberspace and must be respected. COVID-19 has shown that public health is now an international security domain. Uh, beyond just situations of open armed conflict, it is increasingly an area which will require rules of engagement. It is therefore an imperative that medical facilities and facilities helping in the medical processes and health processes are protected from cyber attacks. Cyber crimes committed against healthcare facilities have reached a magnitude and scale where Interpol had to step in recently and issue a purple notice against it in April this year. Alerts were sent to law enforcement in all 194 member countries to support the global fight against this cyber criminal endeavor. A purple notice is issued to seek or provide information on modus operandi, objects, devices, concealment methods used by criminals targeting facilities. The advent of the uh, pandemic, the field of operation for malicious cyber attacks has now moved from being focused on personal credit information, financial information, political information to public health data. Data breaches are widely observed in the healthcare sector and can be caused by many different types of incidents, including credential stealing malware, uh, an insider who either purposefully or accidentally discloses patient data, uh, lost devices or hijacked devices, personal information uh, breach uh, is now uh, something that the black markets uh, prize uh, heavily. They are becoming far more valuable than credit card credentials, for instance and cyber criminals are also targeting medical databases so that they can sell personal health information for gain uh, in the black markets. Another concern is the number of attacks against medical personnel. Uh, at the time, the call to protect medical facilities from cyber attacks was made on May 25th. The ICRC had recorded more than 200 physical incidents of violence against healthcare workers and facilities linked to COVID-19 across more than 13 countries. These are only document cases of violence the two numbers may be much more. How do we tackle this question? How do we keep the integrity of the digital healthcare systems and health personnel? Uh, how do we uh, respond to uh, this emerging domain? My colleague Arjun and the esteemed panelists present here will discuss and determine and respond to the central que question. They will consider the increased disruptions to the destruction of healthcare facilities and systems through operations that seek ransomware, that seek to harm communities, that seek to spread misinformation and lies, that seek to undermine medical research and slow down vaccine research, and that seek to corrupt treatment based on the purity of data sets. Uh, please don't uh, uh, hesitate uh, to join this conversation as well. Uh, do leave your comments and questions in the Q&A and chat box windows so that we can bring you in. And uh, uh, Arjun, I'm gonna hand this over to you to guide us through the next one hour of this conversation and uh, I want to once again thank you and all our panelists for joining us this afternoon and to the community who's participating in the Zoom webinar. Arjun, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Sunny, for that introduction and for setting the stage for this discussion extremely well. Um, so I am Arjun. I'm an associate fellow at uh, the Cyber Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation, and I will be moderating this session for today. Um, so uh, we, I'm happy to say that we have a very distinguished set of panelists present with us today, and I'd just like to briefly go over them and introduce them for the audience. 
So we firstly have Dr. Helen Durgen, who is the Director of International Law and Policy at the International Committee of the Red Cross. We have Dr. Gulchan Rai, who is the Chief Information Security Officer at the Prime Minister's Office. We have Ambassador Amandeep Gill, who serves as Director of the Global Health Center Project on International Digital Health and AI Research at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. We have Kaya Siglik, who is the Director of Digital Diplomacy at Microsoft. And uh, lastly, we have Dhruv Pava, who is the Senior Director of Global Health Strategies. So that is our panel for today, and uh, clearly we are looking forward to a very engaging discussion. But before I hand over the stage for the panelists, I would just like to invite our audience to post your questions on the chat box, like Sammy said. And for those of us who are joining us over Facebook Live or Twitter, please feel free to uh, add your comments in the chat box or uh, on the comments or, or tweet at us, and we will we'll be able to raise this to the panelists. So without uh, taking much more time, I'd just like to turn over the session to uh, Dr. Helen Durden to make her opening statement. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Samir, and everyone involved. It's, it's a real pleasure to take part in this webinar on securing healthcare online that we've co-organised together. So it's a great delight. So thank you. Um, now, as has already been articulated, the COVID pandemic has made us all realise even more the importance of healthcare. It obviously has put an unprecedented burden on healthcare facilities around the world. And in this situation, the ICRC is deeply concerned about physical violence against healthcare workers and facilities. Um, but we're also very concerned about potential humanitarian consequences of cyber attacks against the healthcare system, which is the topic we're discussing today. Now, the current pandemic has pushed governments, businesses, international organisations, and in fact, today we're an example of it, to favour working remotely where possible. Um, so this has put an extra strain on the maintenance of strong uh, cyber security. And we have seen that hackers, advanced persistent threats, ATPs, and other malicious actors, as has been flagged, have tried to make the most, sadly, of this opportunity. And we've seen a, a, an increase in the reported number of cyber attacks. And I understand this has been the case in India, uh, but one of the distinguished uh, panelists, I think uh, Mr. Ra, will, um, will dwell on this. Uh, so I won't spend much time on this myself. Now, unfortunately, cyber attacks do not stop at the doors of hospitals. And this spring, cyber attacks have affected uh, the, the capacity in many states, including the Czech, Repu Czech Republic, in Spain, in France, in Thailand, and in the United States, as well as uh, important international organizations like the World Health Organization. Um, so these attacks have obviously come at a time where medical facilities and staff are already under immense pressure and they're needed more than ever before. Now, the development of uh, information and communication technology, as we all know, including the development of cyberspace, offers a range of tremendous benefits and opportunities for states, societies, communities, individuals, and even humanitarian organizations like the ICRC. Uh, and this is also uh, clear in the healthcare sector. We have in hospitals medical devices that are increasingly connected to hospital IT systems, which um, uh, allow for immediate filing and which reduces the risk of error. We also have biomedical devices such as pacemakers or um, insulin pumps that are also co increasingly connected, which offer a range of advantages with doctors, for example, being able to immediately re react. So considering these advantages, digitalization and connectivity of the health sector is likely to increase. I think in this current environment, a solid thing is that it's likely to grow and increase in the coming years, which is why this event today is very timely. Now, obviously, such advantages also come with a range of risks and digitalization and connectivity increase the healthcare sector's risk of attacking its surface and also issues relating to dependency. Now, too often these developments have not been matched by corresponding improvement of cyber security. And certainly a lot of the work of the ICRC has looked at um, some of the lagging behind of cyber security in the hospital sectors, particularly in countries that are under threat of uh, or engaged in armed conflict. Now, cyber operations, as we know, disrupt hospital computers medical supply chains or devices that are too frequently, um, this happens too frequently, and we've seen this in hospitals in India, have also been attacked over the last years. Now, such attacks 
pose great risk to those who are seeking medical care. That can mean for all of us, for our families, for our communities, for societies. It's pretty clear that if a, if a hospital no longer functions, life-saving treatment may not be available and the humanitarian consequences of that are dire. So as was explained at the introduction, we have witnessed cyber attacks targeting medical facilities and organizations on the front line who are the responding to the current pandemic of COVID-19. Um, and they range from um, ransomware operations, which aim to cripple primary and urgent healthcare networks in exchange for payouts, to disinformation campaigns aimed at undermining and disrupting wider elements of the response to pandemics. So these attacks, as I stated before, clearly endanger human lives by impairing the ability of these critical institutions to function slowing down the distribution of essential supplies. So with hundreds of thousands of people already uh, having perished due to COVID-19, medical care is more than important than ever before. So the attacks that we've, we've talked about underline the vulnerability of the sector to cyber attacks, as I stated before, at a time when medical care is needed more than ever before. Um, and this will not sadly be the last health crisis I think we're looking at a future where this will not be the last peak health crisis and the real attacks and threats of cyber attack and their potential uh, must be a wake up call. So this is why the ICRC president, as was mentioned, uh, along with a, a group of over 40 leaders and, and um, recently called upon states to work together. This is a, a humanitarian issue that has to rely upon working together or upon um, a multidiscipline approach and, and people coming together um, and assert in unequivocal terms that cyber operations against healthcare facilities are unlawful and unacceptable. And we were privileged to have you joining, uh, joining this call, uh, Mr. Saren. So thank you for that. We do not tolerate physical attacks on healthcare infrastructure. So we must not tolerate cyber attacks whether in times of peace or armed conflict. So we will continue to raise our voice and call on governments to work together to join forces with civil society, with the private sector, with, uh, with, with experts, with academics, with think tanks to ensure that medical facilities are respected and protected and that perpetrators are held to account. And above all, that governments should take time and action to stop high cyber attacks on hospitals and medical facilities. I think there's no doubt that the time to act is right now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Helen, for your remarks. Uh, your point is well taken that uh, healthcare facilities are especially vulnerable at this critical time and that we need to come together to sort of put out a call and say that cyber attacks must be condemned in the strongest words and declared as unlawful. Uh, now, can I ask Dr. Gulshan Rai to uh, make his opening statements, please, sir? Thank you, Arjun. And uh, I think I uh, I will just take up what uh, my previous speaker has left out, Helen has left out. I remember in 2017, when the WannaCry hits, one of the uh, prominent aspect of the WannaCry was, apart from your commercial sector, was the uh, NHS of the UK being hit very badly. That was the uh, a major, in, I mean, kind of instance of the uh, cyber attacks on, on the health system. Not that the only NHS was impacted, but the health system of many other countries were impacted, but not to that extent at the NHS of the UK. Now, the cyber security aspect certainly has become very, very important in light of the uh, digitalization, which uh, she mentioned, uh, which is uh, going up and up there. Uh, today, it is difficult to distinguish between the systems in the commercial sector or health sector, or within the health sector, what you use for your normal MIS purposes, or use for the clinical purposes or the patient care system. It's very difficult to distinguish. Most of the time, they're all served by the same backbone, same network, and the uh, and in a hospital, all kind of functions are performed by the same equipment there. See, the couple of years ago, and to some extent it is valid till today, the couple of years ago, the 
most of the medical equipment, even if they were using the general purpose equipment there, they had a proprietary protocol and proprietary software. It used to go under strict kind of a, a quality control and the uh, all other uh, checking part, and still it is true that. But the, what the difference come up there, the protocols and technology which is used in the medical hospital, medical equipment there, they are all general purpose systems there. They try to recognize the entire software. But more as the time is moving on, we are using the open standard, open interfaces and open kind of equipment. So the proprietiness of the system is being diluted towards the general aspect. This general aspect leads to more cyber attack and more issues which the normal other uh, sector is facing that. That's one aspect. Second aspect is that your entire operation aspect, operational aspect and the surgery aspect in the operational theater or the patient uh, treatment system, they are getting combined together. I remember the All India Institute of Medical Sciences when they were buying the PAC system for the surgery. It was connected as first network is almost seven years ago. They 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 connected on the orthopedic pack system on the common network of the uh, AIMS hospital. Um, now this is the common uh, packs is a common system in almost all the hospital. The imaging equipment, whether it is a MRI or the CAT scan or other thing or other uh, uh, ultrasound systems, they are all connected to the network. It's it's the it's a, something which is factual today in country like India too, which we, which is in almost quite lacking behind in terms of technology when it comes to medical sector there. So the issues has become real because of the technology merging between commercial and medical sector. The hacker is not able to distinguish whether it is a medical system or a surgical system or a commercial system. They, they is hardly distinguish aspect there. Now, that aspect technological, and then we are going to have the all, all this technology like AI, ML, all the all innovative technology we talk about it, and IoT are going to be quickly in a, in a, are going to be deployed in a big manner in the, in the health sector also there. This one aspect of the technology, which is now going to pose a lot of challenges before us in terms of the cyber breaches, cyber attacks there. I said no matter the technologies are tested more rigorously than the normal system, but software is software and no software is perfect at the, at the, in the beginning and it gives the chances for the uh, breaches and the vulnerabilities part of it. The second aspect is that our processes, our processes are coming in the way in identification. For example, the privacy, the GDPR which has been announced, uh, which is now implemented GDPR it stops us i mean it it uh, inhibits us to identify from where the attacks are coming because the all those the parameters which used to help us to identify the the uh, the uh, 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 hacker is no more visible whose directory is no more visible there that's a great aspect is coming uh, to the privacy aspects are becoming more in identifying the yes it helps us to prevent preserve the data but it stops us to identify from where the attacks are coming so we can identify so those legislation are coming in a way to do that the as far as india is concerned we are somewhat uh, uh, somewhat i mean a god's grace you may, you may say god's grace or maybe that uh, our medical kind of a, a systems are not connected to the extent they are connecting in the West and the advanced uh, country like US there. So that is a great advantage. Most of them are working still in the standalone kind of a environment there. But it's a matter of time. So some of the some of the patient care system are, have started shift, have, have now shifted on the on a network on a uh, complete uh, interconnected environment. So the issues have started emerging. So far in India, we have not uh, got any case where the medical equipment of the sensitive nature, uh, the kind of a thing I described, have been attacked. There, there have been attacks on the. Uh, in the hospital systems, which are largely serving the uh, administration or the finance, but there has been no case where the systems are attacked. Maybe that the uh, in India it is very common to get the medical data from any hospital is, is a open secret. So the hackers are no more interested to seal the data by virtue of cyber attack. 
but then the situation, situation is not going to prevail in time to come there. I, I remember the uh, when I was in the government, the, the uh, Red Cross official in India, they met me, and they said future war is not going to be the, uh, the kind of a war we imagine. And then I said, the Red Cross sign, the red, will it turn to the yellow or what will turn over there? This is the scenario which we need to think because uh, there is a danger to the medical sector and rightly has been expressed and and uh, we have we need to do something uh, better in terms of our uh, in both in terms of technology in terms of processes as well as the international norms there uh, arjun will i get a few a few uh, a second chance or shall i get i mean what are the international scenario which i i'm seeing that uh, no sir so we will come back to you with with the uh, second round of questions in the end so i think we'll just want to get a panel this one Thank you very much sir, for those points. So I think your the takeaway from your address is basically that as the technologies and the processes that govern these technologies get more complicated, this is also raising some practical difficulties we face in terms of, of uh, how we sort of perceive and tackle these cyber attacks that's, uh, that we're facing today. Uh, that's an interesting point. So um, then now I would like to call upon uh, uh, Kaya Siglik to make her opening statements. Sure. Uh, thank you and hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, like Helen said, I think this is a really timely and an important debate to have. Um, so we're delighted to be able to be part of it. I would like to spend this few minutes at the beginning to sh share um, what we at Microsoft have seen online in recent dates. So to share some of the data that um, that we have been seeing and hopefully this will continue to help feed um, our thinking as we sort of follow up upon this this initial round of our interventions as has just been mentioned you know we have all seen um, whether in the news whether in uh, whether actually as victims uh, that hackers have been using COVID-19 19 as a theme over the last few months. Um, these attacks happen everywhere in the world. Um, this is a global threat. And as it has been mentioned here, um, targets included hospitals. They also included financial institutions, governments, and of course, individuals. The thing that I think w I would like to pull out a little bit more is the, the, the issue of trust um, and the impact that has on um, our off offline security effectively as well. As part of their attacks, hackers impersonated trusted entities like government departments, the World Health Organization, and other healthcare related group, leveraging their established credibility to bring in, lure in unsuspected people. So they would click on malicious links or reveal their personal information. Interestingly, despite you know, the perceived increase in online threats, which I think has been coming through in this conversation, um, our data shows that the overall number of attacks hasn't actually increased. It's been fairly stable for the period. Um, so to summarize, the, the number didn't change, but what did change, because obviously we have all felt that there is an increase, is the way attacks were conducted and they rose to our attentions. Cyber criminals are sneaky and they adapted their tactics. They started using different traps to get people to fall for their tricks. And they were in line with world events, in this case, case the global pandemic. So if we look back the last few months at the data, in early February, where everything was pretty quiet, um, and if you remember, it was around 11th, 10th, somewhere like that, February, where the World Health, Health Organization gave the pandemic the name, calling it, calling it a pandemic, calling it COVID-19. The next week, we saw cyber attacks mentioning or using COVID-19 increased 11 times. This kept going up um, through the first two weeks of March. This is the period where uh, across the world, it coincided with nations beginning to take action, 
would reduce to reduce the spread of the virus and to travel if the restrictions became uh, started coming into effect. By the end of March, all countries around the world have seen a COVID-19 themed attack. After that, the increases stopped. Um, the, the, but effectively, it, they didn't go away. They just became sort of part of the landscape of um, of the online environment, your typical phishing compromise patterns. I would also say something that Helen in particular highlighted. We've seen several persistent nation state and other threat actors that targeted healthcare organizations and governments um, or used COVID-19 as part of the, the, their campaigns. You, have, you might have also seen warnings about cyber espionage in particular related to, to vaccine research that several, of gov several governments have issued in, in recent weeks and months. To say that this trend is concerning is an understatement. Um, these are fundamental institutions in a, in a situation of crisis that should not be undermined. Um, this is why the team at Microsoft, we have been doing several thing, things to challenge some of these trends. Uh, and trends, um, a lot of them on the technical side, from open sourcing our threat intelligence to making sure that the latest security features are available, uh, often free of charge, to as many vulnerable organizations as possible. We also started using our public voice uh, more fully. We supported the United Nations call for digital ceasefire at this time of crisis, and we also joined the letter that uh, the ICRC and the Cyber Peace Institute that was mentioned earlier, um, and Samir, um, <laughs> pulled together and signed and, and called for action to protect healthcare and medical facilities around the world at this time, and hopefully for the long run. Um, in addition, we also um, joined with the Cyber Peace Institute in their initiative um, that's called Cyber for Healthcare, if you wanna check it out that looks to provide free services for nonprofits and healthcare organizations that are suffering for some of these attacks, trying to not only help them recover when something bad happens, but to strengthen their defenses ahead of, ahead of time. Similarly, we partner with our friends in the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, which is the most significant industry agreement on international cybersecurity and delivered a series of webinars as well as on these topics, as well as set of resources that all of our signatories have volunteered, both in terms of how you protect yourself, free resources, all available on the Cybersecurity Tech Accord website still today. Um, finally, I want to echo again a point that Helen mentioned, you know, like as I talked about some of the things that we've been doing, some of the things we've done, obviously, as Microsoft alone, but many, in fact, probably most of them, we, did, we have done in partnership with others, whether there's industry, civil society groups, or governments around the world. This is a challenge, much like a pandemic, that we can only solve together, not, not, not sort of uniquely independently. So hopefully that's something we could talk about how to make that, that sort of framework environment work better. Uh, thank you, Kaya, for those those interventions, and it's very uh, promising to hear of all the different initiatives that Microsoft has been taking, along with others in, in alone and in collaboration with other actors in this in this space. Um, so now, can I call upon uh, uh, Ambassador Gill to make your opening statement, sir? Thank you very much, uh, Arjun, and thank you, Samir, for this opportunity. It's an honor to share uh, this panel with. Uh, uh, all those who've spoken before me and who'll come after me. So um, I want to uh, make three points, general points before of the international league situation. And I'll make these points from the perspective of my current perch as the uh, project director for the International Digital Health and AI Research uh, Collaborative in Geneva. Uh, but also uh, drawing on my experience previously as the executive director for the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation, co-chaired by Jack Ma and Melinda Gates. Um, uh, and the report was released in June and 
a roadmap uh, which includes action points related to cybersecurity uh, was issued uh, recently. What you see today with regard to uh, the cyber attacks on the uh, health infrastructure uh, is obviously part of the uh, overall increase uh, in uh, these uh, threats uh, driven by a number of uh, factors which other speakers have outlined before me. The increased attack surface, the increased opportunities, uh, the increased vulnerabilities coming out of the digitalization of different domains, including health. But there are some specificities and it's important to bear those in mind. One is that there are three levels at which these attacks pose a problem. Uh, one uh, which is relatively new is the systemic level. Uh, a number of countries are investing in architectures called health stacks. Uh, there is an India health stack that's coming up. Uh, Estonia has a health stack which it has built on uh, the experience of a digital ID for all Estonians. UK has a biobank which combines data, molecular science data from a large number of UK citizens uh, and makes it available for research. Uh, similarly, Singapore. So there has been this uh, stacking up of uh, digital uh, data uh, to be used for either healthcare or research. Uh, so there is a vulnerability at that level. Then you come to the institutional level, uh, hospitals, particular research facilities, uh, particular epidemiology related uh, uh, surveillance uh, or testing centers. Uh, so they have become critical nodes uh, in the infrastructure of any country. Uh, and the, I, at, in, among these institutions, I would also include the World Health Organization, which has been subjected to an unprecedented number of cyber intrusion, cyber attacks, and I would also include here certain sources of information that are important uh, in terms of uh, the, the reliance by the general public on guidance uh, in um, situations related to uh, public health. And then obviously we have a third level uh, which is expanding just as the first level is expanding. And this is the personalized or personal health records, medical records of a large number of uh, citizens. We saw an example from Singapore, how some of that data can be compromised, but as you increase for legitimate reasons, for good reasons, uh, that uh, data set, so the, the vulnerabilities, the number of people handling that data, the number of institutions involved will go up and the vulnerabilities uh, will uh, uh, increase. Now, if we look ahead, so these three uh, uh, threat, um, uh, related uh, vulnerabilities, levels in a sense. But then there is another emerging area, uh, which is political, which is sensitive. And this is the use of uh, intelligence derived from data, whether using AI tools or otherwise, uh, to present through smart dashboards in real time to decision makers scenarios in terms of managing the logistics of testing, supply chains, etc. So if you cannot rely on the data sets, on the integrity of the data sets, the confidentiality of the data sets related to that kind of decision making, it has a larger national security type uh, of uh, an impact. So I want uh, the audience, uh, the other panelists to bear this in mind. Then coming to what is it that is lacking at the international uh, level, I think, uh, Previous speakers have mentioned how the, uh, the normative space needs to be, in a sense, clarified, uh, sharpened. Uh, uh, Samir was part of this uh, global initiative where one of the first norms that they came up with was the integrity of electoral infrastructure, that this should be a safe haven. Uh, so um, uh, how can we do that in the health space, keeping in mind what And very hard for the hacker or anyone else to distinguish what is health or what is something else, what is civilian uh, protected or civilian not so protected. Uh, so the need to clarify uh, the normative space, there are currently two exercises underway. There is the uh, open-ended working group uh, chaired by the Swiss ambassador uh, in New York. Uh, and then there is a group of governmental experts, which is 
the latest in a series of exercises to clarify the application of uh, international norms, including those enshrined in the Geneva Convention. So this needs to continue, this needs to be accelerated, taken up with more urgency. The second aspect is the issue of attribution. Deterrence can only be uh, instituted, uh, measures can only be uh, taken against those who are exploiting these vulnerabilities if we can identify them. And so attribution is a very important aspect, which is of course at one level very political. If you are talking about uh, APTs, then there is obviously a state connection. So there is a higher level of sensitivity in more before you call out anyone's name. But I think there is a need to start at the technical expert level to put together a neutral capacity, assessment capacity. Uh, and this can initially be uh, kept away from finger pointing, more uh, um, tuned with, you know, what is the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the clarifying some of the liabilities through attribution in terms of insurance premiums, payouts, etc. cetera. Uh, but eventually it has to be built up in that kind of neutral trusted uh, uh, setting for uh, attributions and assessments. I hesitate to say that this should be inside the UN at this stage. Perhaps that will be politically more difficult, but certainly uh, in a neutral setting, this should be started right away. Uh, the, the third aspect uh, and the last point I'd like to make, also keeping in mind some of the guidance that we got from the, uh, the organizers of this webinar, is how could different multi-stakeholders uh, come into the picture? How can we involve the private sector, civil society, and other actors uh, better? I mean, previous speakers have obviously mentioned uh, the need for capacity building where companies such as Microsoft and others uh, are um, making a, a contribution. But I like to take this beyond the capacity building uh, aspect to, um, uh, to the aspect of uh, industry standards, to the aspect of a regular technology review so that vulnerabilities, risks uh, can be more transparently shared. Uh, so that uh, uh, policymakers can understand how the technology landscape uh, is uh, uh, evolving uh, and uh, evolving, and how the uh, industry itself uh, can become a partner in um, uh, traceability, in attribution, in building resilience uh, uh, against cyber attacks for uh, health systems overall. So I'll stop there, and I look forward to the question. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for those uh, pointed and crisp comments and the different levels of problems we have and, and where we need to be trying to solve these problems. So uh, now can I call upon uh, our last panelist, uh, Dhruv, to make your opening statements? Hi, Arjun. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so I would just like to add a little different dimension to the whole conversation, which is um, this whole conversation about the human angle to cybersecurity. And as you know, uh, Global Health Strategies works um, on communications and we look to advance issues and power campaigns that um, you know, look at global health and well-being, right? So while we don't look at the technology aspect of it and maybe in the regulatory aspect of it, but in our experience working with many different health programs, when it comes to, uh, you know, usually there is a very basic human element to it. And when it comes to security, um, our initial research has showed us that, in fact, one statistic that I saw at the very beginning, which I was uh, taken aback by, is that, you know, 97% uh, of the attacks that happen online target people and not really the technology itself. Right? That tells us a lot that our own human nature and why, why do hackers and people do that? Because they do know that our own human nature makes us most vulnerable, right? Uh, because the study of human biases and failabilities and even our own misjudgments are actually very well documented. And on digging deeper, I actually found that it was like, oh my God, in fact, I have most of these habits, right? Do I uh, press the I accept button on various different um, websites I go just to, you know, get on with my work? Will I actually give up some amount of security for more convenience? As much as I would hate to admit it, maybe I would, right? 
uh, what is my level of desirability to always be connected, download information from various platforms, share it on various different platforms, even though I know it might be vulnerable, right? Because ultimately, what kind of incentives do I have? Is it aligned with that of my organization? Do I even have a proper perception of the risk, right? Uh, is, 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 my, is there a lack of knowledge on how this data might be used? Right. So, for example, we all know, uh, you know, there's this with us humans, we have this, um, you know, tendency for hyperbolic discounting. Right. And that's why uh, many of us don't even have, say, the kind of health insurance we do, because our issue is, you know, it's not going to happen to me. Right. Um, so knowing all of this, my limited point is obviously technology uh, related issues are exceedingly important. Regulatory issues are exceedingly important. But there's also a very basic human element to it, which we should address. And maybe the need is to build a human firewall, right? And how do we do it? Um, there are various examples today of incredible communications um, and behavior change uh, you know, campaigns that have done really well. Just look at our own uh, acceptance and response to climate change over the last 10, 15 years, right? Um, there are various examples. Let me just uh, give you one really small and maybe a little funny example as well of how we can, um, you know, exploit our own human vulnerabilities to make inexpensive small changes that have larger impacts. So, for example, uh, Rory Sutherland, who's the head of Ogilvy in uh, the UK, um, you know, in fact, I think it was one of his friends which was asking him the solution to. So they were looking at their this like tall um, office building and. They had to change all the elevators because it was uh, working. It was the speed was very slow, and they had to spend millions of dollars. Ultimately, Rory came up with a simple solution. He was like, "You know what? Just install floor to ceiling mirrors, and see what happens." Most people, because they were just looking at themselves, right, uh, forgot about the speed of the elevator. So what I'm trying to say is that yes, we should look at the technology look at the regulation, all of that, look at the politics of the issue, but also the human level, let's see how we can change behavior to address this. And maybe security experts will also have to become storytellers and uh, put out messages that really stick and are able to change behavior. Right? That's my limited point. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Thru, for that uh, interesting and uh, different sort of a perspective on tackling the problem of these cyber attacks, which is to focus more on uh, the people themselves and to sort of educate them on, on how to handle uh, the cyber hygiene habits and everything better than that. So uh, now that we've heard from all the panelists, uh, I'm just going to uh, use my moderator privileges and post a couple of uh, questions for the panelists themselves before we see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, so uh, can I come back first to Helen and uh, uh, say that, uh, so, so your, uh, the call from ICRC basically says that uh, we need to come together as, as a global community to sort of uh, state that uh, attacks and cyber uh, cyber attacks on health institutions must be uh, condemned and uh, prohibited. Uh, but uh, since the cyberspace is is like a very uh, fast changing and it's 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 a relatively sort of a nascent space, uh, do you think that the international law norms have have caught up uh, to what we're trying to do here and? Uh, do you think that there are any multinational processes that's ongoing currently where these discussions are happening and, and what exactly do these narratives have to play about it? Well, thank you. It's a, it's a big question and in fact could be a, a full seminar in itself, but let me try and be brief because it's uh, wonderful to be on a panel with such experts with different views. Um, in terms of the legal framework, well, we here in the ICRC are most concerned about international humanitarian law, which is of course the law of war um, and the limits to cyber operations during armed conflict. And I think the starting point is that there are limitations to any methods and means or any weapons used uh, during times of warfare, um, whether they're old or new. So whether it's a, a cluster munition, a landmine, a club, a, a machine gun, or cyber attacks, there are limitations, well established and universally ratified. Now, just to step back a minute, um, IHL, International Humanitarian Law, does require that medical facilities and personnel 
during times of armed conflict should be respected and protected by parties to the conflict at all times, and that belligerents, those who are fighting, uh, must, not, must not harm medical infrastructure through cyber operations and must take great caution to avoid incidental harm. I think it's important to, to understand in a conflict zone, uh, there's a, t a direct targeting, but there's also incidental harm. And so measures to protect uh, the medical facilities against effects of cyber attacks must be implemented in peacetime. And that's one of the calls we're making, uh, the need to act now um, in peacetime before the outbreak of conflict. We often say there's no use doing a fire drill in the middle of the fire. You've got to have all those things in place beforehand. Now, if complied with, if um, the principles of IHL are complied with by the belligerents, the protection uh, afforded by IHL is very strong and all encompassing in our views. And obviously there's a distinction between what the law says and what happens in reality. But I think, for example, we in the ICRC claim that the protection of medical data is, is an important element that has to be looked at. So um, I think that international humanitarian law offers protections in peacetime, of course, and for inst instance, there's a range of international human rights law that would acquire, require states to respect and ensure the right to life and the right to health of all persons within their jurisdictions, and that too might be uh, measures that must be taken to prevent third parties from interfering by these cyber rights. In, um, during times of peace. So I think uh, uh, as in a nutshell, there are a number of rules that we must think about and also raise, I think every single uh, member of the panel has talked about the need to work together. And perhaps there may be in the tech sector, there's not as much knowledge about international humanitarian law. And perhaps for us international lawyers, we need to learn more about the tech sector. So there's something important where we don't want to spend too much energy reinventing the wheel. That being said, and the second part of your question, just briefly, I think it's already been well expressed by the ambassador about the two processes that are mandated by the United Nations General Assembly on cyber. Um, I think that it's very important, uh, if I may say so, this year, the ICRC called in one of these processes, uh, the open-ended working group, and I'll just quote here for a moment, um, that there should be, uh, states should not conduct or knowingly support cyber activities that would harm medical services or medical facilities and should take measures to protect medical services from harm. So we've called for this norm um, to be drafted to apply at all times, both in peace and outside armed conflict. So this norm would um, aims to reaffirm the existing and clarify the existing obligation states have. Um, we also believe that this norm, so to speak, it develops and, and builds on the uh, 2015 endorsement by the UN General Assembly, uh, which has a, a, similar, a similar norm about states should not conduct or knowingly support ICT activity contrary to its obligations under international humanitarian law that intentionally damage critical infrastructure or otherwise impair the use of operations for critical infrastructure to provide services to the public. So I think there is a, a lot of uh, activity being undertaken. Um, I think as we have all noted in the current environment, it's more important than ever to push. Um, the ICRC believes that endorsing a standalone norm on the need to respect and protect healthcare is advisable. Uh, and, and we've got an environment that underscores this. So um, I think it's really important also that any norm does not replace existing international law. It complements it, it restates it, reaffirms it, it builds it up, it surfaces up in the cyber context. Uh, and that we strongly believe existing international law continues to buy, bind states even in cyberspace. So thank you for those questions. And I think this is a, a really critical matter that we will continue to raise our voice about. All right. Uh, thank you, Helen, uh, for those responses. Um, can I uh, skip back to uh, Ambassador Gilnard because I know he's also told me that he needs to uh, sort of make an exit at six o'clock because he has another meeting to attend. So uh, can, I, can I ask you, so considering your experience uh, and expertise with this whole uh, domain of artificial intelligence, that, that do you think that emerging technologies like artificial intelligence have a big role to play in uh, sort of supporting this, this battle against cyber attacks and terrorism institutions? And if yes, uh, how could we leverage such technologies to sort of take this uh, uh, fight of ours forward? Uh, yes, uh, a role to play, uh, the role that's going to grow uh, but that, a role that will cut both ways. Uh, so uh, AI will make it easier for cyber 
to mutate in response uh, to defense measures. Uh, it'll also at the same time enable defense to cover um, a larger attack surface area and be more agile in responses to attacks. So it's really going to be an arms race in some ways between offense and defense of the kind that we have seen with uh, some other uh, technologies. Uh, and then as IOTs come in in a big way, cyber physical systems come in a big way, I think the vulnerabilities are going to be very complex uh, uh, and you move to infrastructures that are based on 5G, 6G. So those complexities uh, can only be handled through AI. Uh, but the jury is out how this will play out uh, in the long run. Uh, one quick point I want to make on the applicability of existing norms. Uh, so this is something that uh, I have expanded in a piece for the ICRC's review that's uh, forthcoming. But I think the difficulty today is uh, picking on Helen's remarks uh, that uh, one, uh, there is no consensus on how existing norms apply and who should apply them. Uh, so people may agree on certain principles, but how they should be uh, put into effect. You know, I've seen that while chairing the lethal autonomous weapon system discussion, uh, I've seen that in the context of the cyber GG. The other problem is uh, that the applicability, because the traditional distinctions in international humanitarian law between a civilian object, a military object, uh, you know, the, the principles, the IHL principles require that clarity to become fully applicable. So that's contested today, that whether these apply in peacetime or not. And the third issue is uh, that people argue that you need to have new law. So there is a legal, uh, in, their, uh, in their perception, there's a legal vacuum, you need to fill that with new treaty making, which as we all know, takes time, is uh, again going to be uh, very difficult. So they question uh, in principle the applicability uh, so motto of existing norms, either from the actual space or the international human rights space uh, into, uh, into this arena. And that's why these two processes are important. Landing them in a good place is important, but also having a safety net around them of these multi-stakeholder initiators uh, and uh, civil society and industry involvement, that's important. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, for the responses. Um, now I'd like to come back to uh, Dr. Gulshan Rai and uh, ask him about, uh, because I know that India has had uh, somewhat of a different stance and the applicability of international law to, to the cyber space and how it sort of governs the whole cyber attack space. Because, because we have said at some forums like the OEWG that the existing international norms are not adequate to cover issues like attribution and uh, cyber sovereignty and things. So I was just wondering if you had any comments on this and, and, and uh, how you think we can sort of mobilize international law vehicle to respond to these cyber attacks. Arjun, uh, in my view, we need, the, we need to look at the laws uh, applicable to such kind of a sector, both domestic and as well as the international law. Because the two sets of law, uh, while they inter, uh, inter, uh, interoperate, they will interoperate, but then there will be two different sets of uh, uh, rules, regulation and law will be there. First of all, we must look at the technological standard. And as I said, with the coming of the open standard and open interfaces there, uh, there is a dilution in terms of many aspects of the uh, relating to security. I think this is a time we need to look at it. Do we have to raise our bar of the security or the quality standards in general there? That's one we need to look at it. Uh, and this is important both at the international level as well as the domestic level. That aspect we need to look at very clearly. The second aspect we need to look at it is that the the uh, the international law and I, I think uh, uh, Amandeep mentioned about it, Ambassador mentioned about it, the UNGG. I myself participated in a couple of the UNGG relating to norms of cyberspace. There, the the two aspects which we need to differentiate from the general aspect, all all other aspect norms of behavior. One is relating to the attacks on the medical institutions or the medical equipment. And second aspect is attribution. These two are really very, very important aspects there. And we need to, uh, as, a, as a UN, as a body, must expedite this thing out of the way 
to agree to this that at least till the time other norms or behaviors in the cyber space are agreed to or some consensus arrives that at least these two aspects are non controversial and I, I, I think out of these two one is certainly non controversial that they there should not be attack on the medical institution or the medical personnel whether it is a peace time or a war time and we should define in and both the system both clearly clearly defined because the aspects will be different in the cyber in the cyber scenario the aspects are different in the physical scenario so this aspect they say some sort of urgency that we must define and this will include even the even the defense forces also because they also have a medical equipment during the war peace time there so i think this aspect should be agreed to without any further delay uh, maybe proposal can be taken the second aspect the a, a priority must be given to attribution of the uh, norms and uh, uh, or, uh, particularly for the technology sector third the uh, 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 the what uh, the organization must come together to define a different set of a, a system which we which with which when i say system is a numbering system by which the medical uh, institutions are are uh, connected together so that it is easy to recognize for anyone whether it is a medical institution it has a it has a pros and cons but then attacks can be easily recognized and prevented there and this is apart from uh, i think my friend from microsoft the private sector has a a big role in the multi stakeholder kind of a model which we agree for the internet governance there and i think private sector has to come forward and work with the government for capacity development and i must say that capacity building capacity development and skill in the area of cyber in the medical sector is much to be enhanced there and that is where the role of the private sector we need to be appreciated as far as india part is concerned i said i described the scenario what we have we have also seen almost 1000% increase in cyber attack during the pandemic but the attacks are on the financial sector and other sector not in the medical sector fortunately we have been safe over here we have a general framework for the uh, cyber security purposes and that is under revision and very soon Before the end of this year, that will be uh, revised. There are going to be special provisions for the medical sector, there. Uh, and uh, that aspect is being strengthened also there. In the meantime, the uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare, which is charged, administrative ministry charged over the health sector, they are also in the process of drafting the Telemedicine Act. They have done some amendment, and they have put uh, as a part of the general act there. where the telemedicine kind of things are recognized but they are laying down in the process and they are in the process of laying down the standards uh, for the data exchange for the data protection aspect of the medical aspect and the third factor which uh, is there that uh, the our personal data protection bill is being examined is in before the parliament and during the parliament committee and i'm sure it will be a law before the end of this year uh, uh, and uh, 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 i mean with that uh, some of the uh, uh, protection will come to the medical sector apart, uh, along with the other sector there uh, uh, and i think uh, uh, we uh, that the some more steps are underway to strengthen that particular sector because this sector in india requires a, a much higher protection and lot more need to be done this is the other side thank you uh, thank you dr rai um, now uh, uh, coming to uh, kaya i just wanted to ask you so how uh, like what do you see being the role of the, the industry actors in terms of coming together as a community to call for for uh, lesser attacks to to sort of tackle the attacks on our health facilities and and do you think there are any initiatives taken even either, either within microsoft or outside which might serve as a model for us to sort of emulate and sort of work towards uh sure and i will be super brief because i know we ran out of time um i, I you know I, i think first of all i would echo what a, a lot of the speakers earlier have said i think it's it, there's really a 
there, there, sh there should be more impetus and, uh, and more effort put into ongoing conversations around um, so some of the international rules um, in this space in particular. Um, we have some rules, um, um, you know, if we look back and, uh, for instance, to reference to the discussions in the United Nations group of governmental experts, we can, which came up with 11 norms in 2015. Um, with those, we would love to see more of those implemented. And that, of course, happens at national level more than anywhere else. Um, and, and, and in those places, not just private sector, but also civil society um, play an important role as um, to, to help shape effective um, and uh, effective, efficient and um, regulatory frameworks to help protect human rights. And being part of that conversation would be critically important. At the same time, we also see there are gaps. Uh, you know, um, um, Helen obviously talked a lot about the international humanitarian uh, uh, law, which sort of applies to the space of war, but we see attacks on a daily basis, often nation state sponsored or led, and they do not take place in a time of war. Um, so, uh, understanding and driving more clarity about what what is permitted there is I think still a debate to come uh, for uh, the coming weeks months and years I think um, and doing th in uh, doing things like the UN did earlier this year um, inviting the civil society and the private sector to have an input to to be able to share their views as users as operators of this space would be really important. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Kaya, for those for those comments. And uh, I see that we're already over time, so I just wanted to uh, come back quickly to the room and uh, ask you, since you mentioned uh, the importance of, of uh, looking at the human aspect of, of uh, uh, preventing cyber attacks and sort of uh, changing behavior amongst people. So I was just wondering if, if you have any suggestions on specific short-term measures that we can take to, to sort of uh, ensure that people are brought more up to speed and how to stay safe during this COVID pandemic and, and where should these, these initiatives start? Uh, thanks, Arjun. Again, I try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, I think that in my, what I uh, felt and saw when researching this subject was there are a lot of issues and a lot of human, uh, you know, based issues and vulnerabilities, right? Um, obviously, I think it's very difficult to uh, attend to all of them immediately, but I think we need to prioritize. Um, as as the cyber experts, all of them have to come together and prioritize, okay, this is the message that needs to be hammered home first, right? Uh, prioritize, and once you prioritize, you know your content, then it's about packaging and dissemination, right? How do you make that message stick? And while it is a very difficult task, uh, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of um, templates, a lot of different ways, a lot of experts who can craft that content and make it make it a message that's, that really sticks, you know, uh, disseminate in a way that, um, you know, creates this powerful moment, right, uh, which then can get people to stand up and take notice and believe that, okay, I am vulnerable, these are the steps I need to take, um, maybe we, we, we leverage, um, you know, the power of one, I think it was Mother Teresa who said that if I you know, talk to everybody or say many things. I'm not saying anything, but if I talk about one, then I can pay attention, right? So let's let's make it a human story. Talk about people, um, how they're vulnerable, what efforts they can take, and how it'll impact them, right? Um, so that's just my initial thoughts uh, on the subject. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Ru. Um, so I think that's all the questions that I had for the panelists. If uh, any of you want to respond to any of the other points raised by the others, that this is a good time. But if not, I see that we don't have many questions from the attendees either, which I think means that we've had a very comprehensive discussion and that we've covered like a lot of interesting topics here. So, uh, in case there are no further comments, then I would just like to thank all of you for for uh, making yourself available for this important discussion, and thank you for a very very engaging discussion and. Uh, I hope to uh, see all of you at, at future discussions like this at a later point. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.